Hey guys. All right, how are you all doing tonight? How are you all doing? Good? Okay, I'm, I'm a little tired. I don't know about you. Hey, really quick, before we get started tonight, hey, if you need a Bible, if there's someone around you that needs a Bible, we got some in the back. Go ahead, take this time now. Uh, go in the back, grab a Bible if you need one. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 6 tonight. Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, while, while you're looking for that, I, I kind of want to explain to you all what, we, what we're going to be speaking about, just uh, not just this week, but over the next couple of weeks um, on on these Monday nights. We're going through this series called God Is, the Attributes of God. We're going in and we're looking at the attributes of God. We're going to be looking at who who God is, who, who is the character of God, and not character in the sense like, oh, God's a character in a story, but character as in these are the characteristics of God. This is who he is. This is how he has revealed himself to us. This is how he displays himself. This is how he shows us who he is. And and that's really what we want to dive into. And tonight we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to look at the holiness of God. So as you're looking for that, Isaiah chapter 6, where we park it tonight, I want to define what holy is, what it means for God to be holy, what the word holy actually means. So it's going to pop up on the screen in a second. But holy, uh, the original Hebrew word for holy is this word pronounced kadosh. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Kadosh is what uh, holy, the word for holy is in Hebrew. And, and the word actually means um, to be set apart, different, or distinct. So, so the word holy, what it means for God to be holy, means that God is set apart. He's different. He's distinct. He's not just like you and I. There's something about God that makes him different. There's something about God that sets him apart from us. He's not the exact same as us. So really quick, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1, and uh, let's, let's go ahead and let's start reading. Isaiah 6, 1, Scripture says, in the year king, that King Uzziah died. All right, so let's pause right here. Uh, right off the bat, we're just going to pause. Um, so King Uzziah, this guy is incredibly important. Now, King Uzziah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, way back in the day, the nation of Israel, it split into two kingdoms, the northern called Israel and the southern call, called Judah. Uh, Uzziah was one of the very few actual good godly kings. Um, and, and, and Scripture actually says, uh, in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 4 and 5, Scripture says, he, being Uzziah, did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God throughout the lifetime of Zechariah, the teacher of the fear of God. During that time, he sought the Lord, and God gave him success. So Uzziah is this very godly king. He became king at the age of 16 years old. That's just three years older than some of y'all in this room tonight. And he was king for 52 years. Oh, uh, just over half a century, he was king. And he was faithful to God throughout it until, until the very end. The very end of King Uzziah's reign, um, Uzziah kind of strayed away. Uh, he, he decided that um, he, since I'm such a great king, I'm such a good king, I don't need to do things God's way anymore. See, God had set apart, um, made holy um, the, 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 the sacrifices that were made to God. And God said, hey, only specific people at specific times a year can offer certain sacrifices. So he set up the Levites, and the Levites and the priests were the ones to, sacri- to make sacrifices to God. But King Uzziah said, listen, I don't need to do things God's way anymore. I don't need to honor what God has made holy. I don't need to acknowledge the holiness of God. I don't need to do that anymore. I can do this on my own. I can make the sacrifice on my own. So he gets up to the altar of God, and he goes to make these sacrifices. And the the, the Levites try to drag him off to make sure he can't make the sacrifice. But then King Uzziah says, hey, if anyone is to touch me, if anyone is to try to stop me from doing this, I will have them killed. So everyone just kind of backs off, like, okay, all right. And right as King Uzziah is about to make the sacrifice that he shouldn't be making because it's not his place, God hasn't set it for him to do so, King Uzziah is struck with this incredibly serious case of leprosy and is killed just a few days later. For those of you who don't know, leprosy is this really disgusting skin disease that makes so slowly your body deteriorate till limbs are falling off, and it's incredibly painful and hurtful, and eventually, King Uzziah died from this. Quite literally, Uzziah was struck dead by God for his disobedience, for ignoring 
what was holy to God, for ignoring what God had set apart, for ignoring what was kadosh. God, God had punished Uzziah for this. And this had shaken the nation of Israel, or the nation of Judah, to its very core. Uh, King Uzziah, was this, he was a faithful servant. He was faithful to follow God. He had been their leader, the nation's leader, for the past 52 ye- years, and God had blessed him. God actually did this awesome thing with, Is- with Judah during this time, where that, hey, when the king was following after God, when the king was being faithful to God, God, God was blessing the king. And, and as a result of that, the whole nation was blessed. The whole nation, when they were following God, tended to be blessed, tended to be taken care of. This is a time of unprecedented prosperity for the nation of Judah, and they, they were benefiting from it. And just out of nowhere, their king had fallen into sin and pride. They didn't know what was going to happen in the next few weeks, months, or years. They didn't know what God ha- had in store for them. They, they were terrified. It was a horrifying event. And it's in that year, during that time, that Isaiah writes, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high on a lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. And that year, King Uzziah died. Isaiah goes through and he sees, listen, Uzziah, he's no longer on the throne, but God is still on the throne. It seems like there's no control in Israel. It seems like everything's falling apart around him. But guess who's still on his throne? Guess who's still in complete control? Guess who's completely unfazed? God is. Guess who is still taking care of everything here? God is. Guess guess who has not fallen off his throne? Guess who is still high and lifted up on his throne? It is God. When everything around us seems like it's crashing around us, when everything around us seems like it's falling apart, God is still on his throne. Not only is he on his throne, he is in complete and total control. Verse 2. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. The, so the, these angels, they're, they're not what you and I traditionally think of with angels. Like when we think of angels, we're like, oh my gosh, like look at this little cherub. He's like this little fat three-year-old with a toy bow and arrow. He's flying around and whatever. The, uh, uh, that, that, ain't, that ain't what these guys are. Uh, these seraphim, these angels are terrifying. They, they, they got six wings. They, they got all this stuff. They, they are terrifying. They are powerful. They are beautiful. They're beings that, when, 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 in Scripture, when, when people see an angel, the first thing the angel is like, hey, hey don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear, fear not. These angels, these are terrifying, powerful beings. In this passage, we see them circling the throne of God, worship him, saying what they say here in verse 3. And one called to another, that being the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. It's kadosh, kadosh, kadosh is the Lord of armies. See, the, the, the Hebrew language is very, very different than English. It's very different than the language you and I speak. Um, so in, um, in, in Hebrew, if you want to express emphasis on something, you repeat it. And the more you repeat it, the more emphasis you place upon it. So like, if you and I were, were talking about a hole, uh, we, we, and it was a really deep hole, we'd say, oh, yeah, that's a deep hole. Or we'd say, oh, yeah, that's a really deep hole. In Hebrew, they would say, that's a whole hole. Or if we're saying that we're talking about the purity of this gold ring, we're talking about how pure the gold ring is. Oh, yeah, yeah, that gold ring, that's pure gold. In Hebrew, they would say that ring is gold gold. And that's how it is. So in this passage, it, what's happening here, to prescribe the, the, the emphasis of how holy God is, they're saying he, God is holy, holy, holy. God is set apart, set apart, set apart. God is distinct, God is distinct, God is distinct. They, 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 this is one of the only things in all the scripture that is used repeated three separate times. And we see this happen in the book of Isaiah when angels are circling the throne of God, calling him holy, holy, holy. And we also see it again in, I, in the book of Revelation when the angels and when all tribes, all tongues, all people are around the throne of God singing holy, holy, holy. Students, the holiness of God, it's one of those things that is, it is God's, what I, what I would say is his most defining characteristic. 
Out, it is out of his holiness that everything else flows out of. Like holiness is one of those things that when you and I, when we speak about it, it's kind of like almost the other attribute of God. Like we don't really, it, it's kind of vague. We don't really know a whole lot about it. It's just kind of like one of those things that's out there. Like, yeah, God's holy, but it, th this is so important. It is out of God's holiness that, flow, that his love flows from. It's out of his holiness that his justice comes from. See, holiness set apart. It is because God is set apart. It is because God is not just like you and me that he is as loving as he is. That he is as merciful as he is. It is because God is so set apart. He is so not the same as you and I that when we were rebels, when we rebelled against God in our sin, God sent his son to die for us so that way we could be redeemed. Could you imagine that? If someone, if someone was an active rebel, an enemy in every possible way, who disrespected you time and time and time again, and not, not only offering that person mercy, but offering them mercy to the point where you send your child to die for that person. It's, it's, it's unheard of. But it's because God is so holy, it's because he's set apart that we see that happen in Scripture. Again, holiness means to be set apart. But I want to look at the, what that means in this context. Uh, the, the first, the, the, I really want to point this out, how God is holy in one way tonight. I want to, um, God is set apart, or God is holy by his glory. God is holy by his glory. In this passage, we see that God is lifted. He is high and lifted up. He's seated on his throne. He dwells in clouded mystery. The temple is filled with smoke. God is massive. He is huge. He is so much bigger. He is so much greater. Not, not, not than just Isaiah, but the seraphim, the angels, these powerful angels that are circling him, praising him. God is so much more. I think oftentimes we, we want to reduce God in our own minds. I, I don't think many of us would say this verbally, but we do this in our actions where we try to image, imagine God as just a slightly bigger version of us, a slightly smarter version of us, just a, a little bit more wise or a little bit more powerful than us. And we do that to kind of rationalize and tell God, like, hey, God, these bad things happened to me. All this stuff happened to me. Um, so I need you to tell me why all that happened. And I could do that because you're just only a little bit above me. I need to know why these things happen. And guess what? I actually need you to bless me as payment for these bad things. And I think it's easy. It's so easy for us to fall into that mindset of doing that. To kind of come in and try to attempt to judge God. Pull him down, drag him down to our level as if he was an equal to us. As if he isn't holy as if he isn't so much greater. God is set apart in every way. Um, I, I, just look at the story of Job, for instance. Job, there's this guy who lost everything. He lost, um, he lost his family. He lost his home. He lost his fields. He lost his servants. He lost his animals. Everything that he had was ripped away from him. Until all that was left for him was he had three lousy friends and a nagging wife. And that's all he had. So Job is sitting here losing everything. And to, to the point where his friends and his wife say, hey, Job, I don't know what it is that you did to offend God. But I think the way you fix it is you'd go apologize to, for God, apologize to God for what, he, for what you did to him. And then, I don't know, find a hole to die in? And that's kind of where his friends, that, that's, his, that's their advice to him. And Job is this guy that God describes as faithful. God describes as no one else is as faithful as my servant Job. Job never did anything wrong, nothing to deserve any of this. And near the end of the book, Job, Job eventually kind of breaks down and he questions God. He's like, it's, this isn't fair. God, God, why did this happen? What's going on? Is this, is this really how you rule the universe, God? Is this really what justice is to you, God? And then we have God's response. And God, God doesn't come down to Job, and he's like, all right, man, Job, okay, so here's the thing. Like, I, like, do you see how, like, this lines up over here? Like, I use that to kind of help this person. And, like, if none of this happened to you, then I wouldn't be able to do this over here. It's so, like, don't, don't you see now, Job? No, we don't get any of that from God. 
God doesn't come down and give all these reasons for why he goes through and he does what he does. Instead, in Job 38, we actually see God come in and say, all right, listen up, Job, okay. I'm going to really quickly take you on a tour, an expansive tour of this whole entire universe that I've created. Um, mind you, with a word. Mind you, I, that I, I, I'm fully sustaining and taking care of right now. I'm, I'm going to do that. But, but, you, but you knew I did that, right, Job? Because you're so smart, since you know so much better than me. Job, did you know, in fact, that actually um, the, the, the lightning bolts report to me? Did you know that like before they strike, they need to come all the way up here and they need to ask me permission before they do what they do? Of course you do that, Job. You're so much smarter. You're so much better. Like you, you, you know all these things. Anyway, Job, now that I've kind of given you a tour of my little universe that I created with just a spoken word, um, why don't you show me yours? Oh, wait, you, you don't have one? Wait, you haven't created a universe of your own, Job? Oh my gosh, that, that, that's crazy. Well, maybe, Job, you're not in a position to judge me. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, I am so holy. I am so much bigger. I am so much further beyond you that you couldn't understand all the reasons. And maybe, Job, just maybe, all you need to do is just trust me. Put your faith in me that even though there's something horrible happening right now, I have a plan. I'm not going to promise that everything's going to be better. I'm not going to promise that I'm going to make everything right for you right now. But I'm telling you, trust me. Place your faith in me. I'll take care of you because I know better. And sometimes God gives that blessing, gives that help immediately after we, when we see this massive blessing. For other people, that blessing, that comes in the, in, the ter- in the form of eternity in paradise with the Lord. The irony of the book of Job is that Job actually never finds out why all this stuff happened to him. Job never realizes, God never tells him. But we know why it happened. We, we, we know that this person in, in, in the original Hebrew is called the challenger walks into the throne room of God and there's all this stuff that happens. We, we, we know the reason why it happened. But Job never does. And I'm not saying that there's no reason that you should never question God. I'm not saying that you should never ask questions of God about anything. The book of Psalms is full of people asking questions of God, why God's doing something. But there is a place for it, and there's a time for it. And God's point to Job is that God is so far beyond us in every way possible that we couldn't possibly see or know enough to bring him into judgment. Later on in life, in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, Isaiah writes, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as the heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Think, 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 think of it this way. Imagine, imagine there's like a, uh, like a granddad. He's like a rocket scientist. He works for NASA. And he's like going off, and he's been building rockets for like 50, 60 years. This has been his whole life. He's building spaceships. And then he has this, like, little five-year-old grandson who's like, hey, that, that's not going to fly. That, that rocket you just built, that, that'll never fly. You want to know how I know? You want to know how I know? It's because it doesn't look just like this one right here. It doesn't look this, just like this one I saw in Star Wars, this little Millennium Falcon. It, it doesn't look anything like that. See, if you want to make a spaceship, it has to look like this, Grandpa. And Grandpa, is he going to go like, oh, man, okay, well, here's the thing, buddy. So do you see like this? Like, is, is, is this a toy? All right, that's not a real spaceship. It can't fly. Like, you, you know Star Wars isn't real, right, bud? You know that, right? Okay, see, like, that, that's not going to fly. And here's all the reasons. And, hey, really quick, let me go ahead and explain to you everything that I learned uh, in my Ph.D. about how rocket ships are made and all that kind of stuff. Is, is that rocket scientists going to spend the next 10 years explaining stuff to this 5-year-old that he could never possibly understand? Or is his granddaddy going to say, I know, I get it, I understand why you feel that way, but trust me, that thing's going to fly, and you're going to get to see it. 
And then they both get to sit down together and see the spaceship take off. See, Job is doing the same, or God is doing the same exact thing with Job. God is coming and saying, listen, trust me. I don't owe you an explanation. And even if I did, you probably wouldn't understand it. Again, I'm not saying there's no place for you to ask questions of God or that God's purposes and his plans don't have any rhyme. There's no reason. They're pointless and you can never possibly understand it. It's just that we should approach the question with the knowledge that God is holy. He is awesome and he is glorious. You see, just because you can't think of a good reason that something bad might happen, that doesn't necessarily mean that there cannot be a reason why it happened. Uh, Evelyn Underhill, she was a politician in the 1900s. Uh, She was a politician in Britain. She once said, um, if God were small enough to be understood, he would not be big enough to be worshipped. Students, God is completely holy. He is set apart. And that's really hard for us to understand at times. It's really hard for us to comprehend because he's just so massive. So we try to explain him. We try to shrink him down to size so he can explain why God does things or make God explain to us why he does stuff or or, or even try to attempt to control God. But we can't. We could never hope to do that. Doing that is a fool's errand. There's no way we could ever possibly hope to do that. Getting back to Isaiah 6, verse 4. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices. And the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Since God's holiness is terrifying. See, the angels here have their faces covered. The pillars, the doorways of the temple, the stones are shaking in his presence. Isaiah, the prophet of God, this guy's been a professional prophet for six chapters now. He is on his face. He's the man with the message from God, the man with the word from God. And he is on his face and he's saying, I am lost, I am ruined, and I'm becoming undone. See, when Job, who God called righteous, who God called faithful, saw God, he said, I had heard a report about you with my ears, but now that I see you, I abhor myself. Or now that I see you, God, I am disgusted with who I am. One other place we see this, how God's holiness is terrifying, is in Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, um, we see that the disciples are on a boat with Jesus. And they're paddling away, uh, just kind of how they do as fishermen. And they're on the boat, they're crossing, they're crossing this body of water, and then this storm comes in. The scripture says that they were made afraid of the storm. These guys are professional fishermen. They're, they're not pushovers or anything like that. They, they know what a storm looks like, and they're afraid of it, and they're worried that they're going to drown. So they call on Jesus, and they wake Jesus up, and Jesus gets up, and he saves them from the storm. And then Scripture says, after they were rescued, Scripture says that the disciples became greatly afraid. They were afraid of the storm, but they were greatly afraid of the rescue. The rescue, the holiness of God here, was more terrifying than the actual problem. Students, God is holy. He is set apart. He is not just like you and me. He is so much greater than us. He is so much more than we are. When angels see him, they cover their faces. When prophets prophets fall like dead men, stones shake. You know, sometimes during camp or like a fall retreat or worship, when worship is just like really awesome. Like we go through, we say, we make statements like, Lord, we just want to stand in your presence or God, come down and be with us. Let, let your presence come here. Like, do, you, do you realize if, if, if God actually did that, if God actually answered that request and ripped off the roof and like poked his head in, 
outside of Jesus, outside of Christ, all of us would be killed instantly because of how holy he is, because how glorified he is. Isaiah says, I am unclean, I am lost, ruined. Some translations say that I am becoming undone. The the Hebrew word here actually implies to be torn apart psychologically. The, 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 The psychological glue that's holding Isaiah's life together, his sense of goodness, his sense of um, 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 clean, cleanliness before God is being ripped apart, torn to shreds before the holiness of God. See, and that's what happens when God's presence enters into your life. When, when the presence of God, when, when you start to be around the things of God more, you start to realize your sense of self-goodness is falling apart. It falls apart because you come face to face with what true goodness is and true holiness. Everything falls apart because we see that the standard for what is right, the standard for what is just, the standard for what is acceptable isn't like that one friend that we have that's a really good guy. It isn't ourselves. It isn't our parents. It isn't our leader. The standard of perfection is God. And all of us are disgustingly short of it. We begin to see how twisted and how sick, how perverse, how disgusting our hearts really are. We begin to see how awful and truly horrible our sin is when you see the presence of a holy God. Later in life in Isaiah 64, chapter 64, verse 6, Isaiah writes, All of us have become like something unclean. And all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf. Once once you understand how holy God is, you begin to realize your your strengths are actually your weaknesses. Notice how Isaiah says that I'm a man of unclean lips. See, for a prophet, his lips would have been like one of his greatest strengths. Similar to how like a pianist would say like one of their biggest strengths is their fingers and their ability to play. Or, or, or a scientist would say their greatest strength is their mind and their able, ability to create and solve problems. Or, or, or maybe even how a, like a pitcher in the MLB would say their greatest strength is their arm and how they're able to just throw that awesome curveball. But Isaiah, he, he's been a prophet for a long time. His lips, the words that he says, the things that he says, the things that he writes, this is how he communicates the word from God. This is how he's made a living. This is how he's lived his life. It's how he delivered the message of God. But but God came down and revealed his holiness to Isaiah and revealed that his strength was a weakness. And he's feeling undone because of it. Uh, Tim Keller Keller said, uh, the holiness of God doesn't make Isaiah ashamed of his weakness. It makes him look at his strengths and realize that they aren't strengths at all. See, when you encounter God's holiness, you begin to feel undone. The glue that holds your life, that held your life together, becomes to go away. It's gone. So let me me ask you this, students. What What is the glue that's holding you together? Is it your athletic ability? Is it your possessions? Is it the way that you can kind of just talk your way out of trouble no matter what happens? Is it your looks? Your popularity? Is it that you just have this awesome family? Is it that you just think that you're the funniest guy ever? So it's be weary of your strengths. Because they can give you a false confidence, a false sense of security that you don't actually need God. And actually, God maybe just needs you. And we kind of use those strengths to kind of start covering up our own sins to justify ourselves before God. By God, God, you saved me, but like, you know, I, I, I did a little bit here. Or God, God, you, you saved me, you died for me on the cross, and you brought me into eternal life. But you know what, I like... Because I did this and this and this, you kind of, you, you didn't have to bring me as far as you had to bring him. Or 
What's holding your life together? What's keeping your life in place? What have, where have you placed your faith? What have you placed it in? That strength, whatever you rely, whatever you rely on, it's actually, it's actually poison. Because it takes your eyes, it can take your eyes off God. And we can use it to try to save ourselves and look good before God, rather than acknowledging our own sin and fully trusting in God. The Apostle Paul says in the end of Romans chapter 14 that whatever is not faith is sin. Wherever you are weak, students, wherever it's like, man, I trip over this again and again and again, or I do this again and again, or man, no, my, my biggest weakness in class is this. Wherever it is that you're weak, naturally, you're going to kind of rely on God a little bit more there. But it's where you're strong that you're going to forget him. It's where you're strong that you're going to say, you know what, God, I mean, I, I don't need to lean on you for this because I'm, I'm actually pretty good here. It's where you're weak that you're like, man, God, I, I need you. I need you in this way today. I need you in this way right now. But it's where you're strong that you're like, you know what, God, I'm, I'm good, man. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me in his hand, and in his hand was a glowing coal that had been taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your inequity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Students, the, the holiness of God is not just terrifying, it is, it is cleansing. See, God's infinite goodness, his infinite holiness means that he's not only filled with justice, but he's filled with love. He's filled with mercy. And we, and we see this a lot more clearly than Isaiah ever could. Because you and I, when we go through Scripture, we, we say, yes, yes, like Isaiah, his, his lips, he was cleansed with coal. But, but Jesus would go through and he would cleanse the whole world to an even greater effect with his death, burial, and resurrection. See, even though God is holy, and you and I, sin cannot survive in God's presence. God is also so loving that he offers himself in our place so that you and I could survive. God is so just that each of us would have to die for our sin. But he's so merciful that he, would have, that he was glad to die in our place so we could have eternal life. That's, that's what it means for God to be holy. What it means for him to be set apart. He's not just like you and me. He's not. He is the Savior. He is the one that made a way when there was no way. See, the cross reveals the holiness of God, that our sin was so bad that we had to die, but he was so loving and merciful, he would die in our place. See, and the only way that you can be in the Lord's presence, the only way that you could be saved is through grace and is through faith in Jesus. See, Jesus was the sacrifice for your sins. He paid the penalty. He took away the curse of your sin. And he took it. And he took your place. And he's not going to force you into a relationship with himself. He's not going to force you into receiving this gift of salvation. It's a gift. You can take it. It's something you have the option. The option of eternity with God and salvation or eternal separation. You have, you have the opportunity to go through, be reunited with God, how you were designed to be, what you were created to be. So as you were created for fellowship and unity with God, you were not created to be sinful. You were not created to be broken. You were not created to be out of his presence. Students, I, I want to encourage you tonight. If, if, if you're looking at your life and you're like, man, I, I didn't realize who God was. I, don't realize, I didn't realize who God is, actually. And I'm looking at my life and, man, you know, I, I don't have a saving relationship with God. He, got, he, he is not my Savior. He is not my Lord. I have never made 
that profession of faith. And, but, I, but, I, but I want to know how. I want to know what it looks like to do that. If, if that's you tonight, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to go ahead and pray. And after that, we're like, we're, I'm going to talk to some people over here. But when, while I'm talking, after I pray, I want you to go ahead and stand up. And I, I want you to go over to Lobby C. So a door that says Lobby C right there. When you go over there, there's going to be a, there's going to be some leaders over there who want to speak with you, want to talk to you about, hey, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. This is what it looks like to be saved. This is what it looks like to do that. And they just want to talk to you and help you understand that better. We're not going to make you do a dance on the stage. We're not going to make you sing a thing. We're not going to force you to do anything. The second thing tonight, student. Maybe tonight while, while, while you heard me speaking, you realize, man, there is some sin in my life and there is something going on in my life that I need to cut out. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a pattern. Maybe it's something you just keep doing over and over again. And I need to get it out of my life. And I'd like some help with that. I'll tell you the same thing. You can go out lobby C. You can talk about we'll have some leaders there who want to help walk you through that. They're not going to give you all the answers. They're not going to be able to tell you, hey, if you do this five-step plan, you're going to be perfect and nothing ever bad will happen to you again. They're, they're, they'll offer you some wisdom. They'll point you in the direction of people who live with you every day. They're going to help you as well. So that would be my encouragement to you tonight. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these students. Thank you. Thank you they were able to study your word. God, thank you. Thank you for offering us mercy, God. Thank you for being so set apart and so good, so loving and merciful that you would die in our place and then be raised from the dead three days later. God, I pray that we would honor you as holy. We would respect you as holy, God. Lord, I pray for these students tonight, God, that they would see you for who you are. They would acknowledge their sin. They would see their sin, and they would do everything they can to cut it out, and they would turn to you. God, you're the God who enables us to walk with you. You're the God who enables us to cut out our sin, to follow you well. Lord, I pray for the students tonight who don't know you. Lord, I pray that tonight they would start that relationship with you, God. This is your son, Jesus, I can pray. Amen.